She was a young, promising, and well to do Japanese schoolgirl, but local gangsters, whose behavior could be described as nothing short of otherworldly and demonic, took her away from the community that she belonged to. Warning, today's video content includes descriptions of extreme acts of torture, violence to a teenage girl who has been tied up by multiple individuals, and gang violence at its absolute worst. Viewer discretion is advised. How would you react if the country that you lived in was consistently ranked as one of the world's top 10 smartest nations by the average IQ and simultaneously was able to pride itself in being one of the world's top 10 safest countries? only to learn that a group of thugs abducted a 16-year-old girl, putting her through the most inhumane suffering imaginable, and then murder her all for their own pleasure. In this video, that is exactly what we are going to explore. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Narratives. Before we get deep into today's video, I must confess that I've been busy preparing to marry my fiancé and I've been busy with a lot of the processes involved with getting married. On this channel, we do a lot of true crime and scary stories. If that piques your interest, please consider subscribing. In today's video, we are going into one of the most horrific crimes committed in Japanese history. Kidnapping and torture do not even begin to describe what took place to a young, innocent, and entirely unsuspecting Japanese teenage girl. Liking this video would also help to remember Junko Furuta and the image that her family and friends left of her and make others aware of what to look out for when they suspect something is wrong in just the right circumstances. Without further ado, let us begin. Today, we are going to Japan, the land of the rising sun, but more specifically, we are going to the city of Misato, located in the Saitama Prefecture of Japan. Situated about one hour's drive to the northeast of Tokyo's downtown area, it is a hidden getaway for tourists who are looking for an authentic Japanese experience and want to get away from the hustle and bustle of the big cities. Misato is home to many cultural attractions that would appeal to tourists. One of the most famous is the Misato Kanon Temple. The temple is known for its beautiful architecture, serene gardens, and the statue of the goddess of mercy, Kanon. Tourists can also visit the Misato History Museum, which showcases the history and culture of the city. Another popular attraction is the Misato Performing Arts Center, where tourists can watch traditional Japanese performances such as kabuki. There are many sake breweries in the area that offer tours and tastings. Misato is also home to many local restaurants that serve traditional Japanese cuisine. Tourists can try dishes such as sushi, ramen, and yakitori. One of the most famous restaurants in the city is the Tsuchiki Sushiko, which is known for its fresh and delicious sushi. Misato Japan is the place for tourists who are looking for an authentic Japanese experience. The city offers cultural attractions, delicious food and drink, and outdoor activities. Misato is a great alternative to the bigger cities in Japan and is definitely worth a visit for anyone who wants to explore the country's rich culture and history. And in Misato, we come across the young and highly motivated, highly aspirational young woman Junko Furuta, a 17-year-old student that would be honor roll material by American standards. Not only did she meet societal expectations of Japanese students at the time, she exceeded them. Academic achievement was the top priority for Japanese high school students during the 1980s. High-performing female students were expected to excel in all subjects, especially in math and science. These subjects were considered essential for success in higher education and future careers. Students were required to take rigorous entrance exams to enter prestigious universities. Junko was not only able to fulfill all of these expectations, she also worked two days each week at a plastic molding factory in Misato so that she could save up some cash and take herself on a graduation trip to celebrate the end of her high school years and give herself a grand reward. Junko had no vices. She wouldn't touch drugs, she wouldn't drink, she wouldn't do anything that would damage her modesty in the eyes of her classmates or family because she was constantly thinking about creating the life that she wanted for herself. It seemed as though Junko had nothing less than an amazing future ahead of herself, but all of that changed on one late November evening. There was one more senior male student that attended the same high school in Saitama Prefecture as Furuta. 
His name was Miyano Hiroshi. He was attracted by her purity of character, while a lot of her classmates thought she was uncool because of her good girl honor student lifestyle. However, Miyano was known to be active with the Yakuza in Saitama Prefecture and was also involved in some criminal activity even before he got involved with Furuta. One day, he had confessed his appreciation of Furuta as a growing woman and proposed that he and she become a couple. She refused him, and he took this as one of the highest insults that he could have ever received. So, he conspired with his friends, who may have also been classmates, to kidnap her. And this would only be the beginning of the terror that she had to face. On the evening of November 25th, 1988, Junko had just finished work at the plastic molding factory and was riding her bicycle home when an associate of Miyano Hiroshi, known as Nobuharu Minato, kicked Junko off her bicycle. Accounts of what exactly took place here vary from source to source. Some say that Nobuharu simply ran away, but I think it is more likely that Miyano, who was pretending to be in the right place at the right time, ran across the street and pretended to get into an argument with Nobuharu and getting the better of Nobuharu managed to scare him off while Nobuharu himself pretended to be scared and ran away. Of course, this was all an act. Miyano wanted himself to look like a hero to a distressed girl in order to earn her trust. Miyano then proposed to walk Junko home, earning a bit of her trust in the process. There could have been many different thoughts going through her mind at that point in time. Whatever was happening, Junko did not have enough time to fully process what was going on during the walk home, and it may have been due to her kind-hearted nature. Somehow, throughout this walk and their light conversation, Miyano managed to either convince or coerce Junko to enter an abandoned warehouse with him. He then began to violate her body without her consent in that warehouse very violently. And when he finished, he also very directly told her that he was a member of the Yakuza and managed to somehow get her into a hotel room through either direct kidnapping or, more likely, through further coercion and threats. When they were in the hotel room, he called his friend Minato, the culprit in the act earlier that evening, as well as Joe Kamisaku and Watanabe Yasushi to join him at the hotel. Then they all took turns forcing her to copulate with them, which is a heinous crime in and of itself. Now it's important to take a moment and see Junko's perspective before she was taken to the hotel. Foreigners to Japan may be thinking things like, why didn't she just run away after what happened to her at the warehouse? Why didn't she run home after what had happened at the hotel? Why didn't she run to a police station and report the crime? I have to give a minor qualifying statement. Presently, I live in Kazakhstan. I lived in Taiwan for eight years and Korea for one semester. Japan is, no doubt, a nation where cities are more compact or bite-sized than Taiwan or Korea with regards to population density and architecture, because it has a much higher cost of living. You can rent a single bedroom, single bathroom apartment for roughly 300 US dollars monthly in Taiwan or Korea. A scream from a girl in a neighboring room will be clearly audible in one of these apartments. The Yakuza and other organized crime syndicates all over Asia put their hands into almost every industry you can imagine, and even have the ability to corrupt police, bribing, or threatening them to collaborate with their mafia tactics. At this point, with the threats that Miyano was giving to Junko, she was obviously already terrified with the events that had already taken place with her. Further, Miyano had already revealed that he knew Junko's residential address and threatened to harm not only her, but also her family if she ran away. She felt that she had absolutely no other choice but to go with their sinister plans for her. There is also a slight possibility that Junko thought the police would not help her in Japan because reporting that a man forced a woman into sexual intercourse with said woman would make the woman a social outcast. Please correct me in the comments if I am wrong, but I do believe that there has been major progress made in reporting these kinds of crimes towards women to the police in the last decade. Moving on, this was not the first time that Miyano and possibly some of the other boys with him that evening had committed this kind of act to a woman. A few weeks earlier, some of them were involved in very similar crimes with a completely different young woman and it is unknown if this was reported to police or if the boys had later confessed to this crime in police interrogations. After discussing what to do with Junko, the boys had settled on taking the defenseless and morally defeated young woman to the home of Minato. For the first few days, Minato was able to pass off Junko as his girlfriend or the girlfriend of one of the other boys and the boys continued to ravage her body as they pleased. 
There was no intervention from the parents of Minato because they were entirely aware of his friend Miyano's connections to the Yakuza, and Minato himself was slowly growing to become more aggressive to his own parents and scare them into submission. On November 27th, less than 48 hours after her disappearance, Junko's mother had filed a missing persons report, and under duress from the orders of Miyano, Junko was forced to call her mother, stating that she had found an amazing young man that she wanted to marry and that her mother should call off the investigation surrounding her disappearance. At this point, the situation became even more bizarre as some sources report that dozens or potentially over 100 different men came into unwanted sexual contact with or committed torture against Junko over the course of her unlawful detainment at Minato's residence. Dozens, if not hundreds of people knew that she was being held in the residence of Minato. All of this happened without anybody informing the police about the events taking place until the night of December 11th, 1988, that is. Before we go any further, it's worth stating that in gang violence and gang culture, the most deranged person is often the ringleader. Miano was the one who started all of this, but gang culture goes much, much deeper than just saying so and so is the boss of this outfit and you will do everything that he says. If you have seen films that depict drug cartels committing violence against non-conforming parties that they attempt to bribe, you know what I'm talking about. Now imagine telling dozens of men that they must copulate with an unwilling woman, and if they do not do as they are told by the ringleader, the ringleader could subject them to humiliation, torture, or harm or threats of harm to the family of anyone who is unwilling to do so. Is it likely that every single man who participated enjoyed every single second of what they were doing? Enter Koichi Ihara. He had told his brother that he had sexual contact with Junko Furuta. At this point, it was not clear if he willingly participated or if he was bullied into doing this, but during the interrogations and on the record, Koichi professed that he was bullied into committing this act against her. On December 11th, the police had acted on the tip-off that they had received from Koichi's brother for whatever reason. Maybe he wanted to see Junko Furuta rescued. Maybe, perhaps he secretly did not like his brother Koichi, or maybe he simply did not like the Yakuza. Two police officers arrived with a knock on the front door of the two-story residence of Minato, at which point Minato's parents answered the front door. The police then stated that a missing woman was reported to be in the house that they were right in front of. Minato's parents answered the front door and stated that there was no missing woman and, without hesitation, invited both of the officers inside their house to search if they so pleased. The officers, in a lapse of police protocol and extremely poor judgment, took what they were told as the truth and decided that there was no further reason to investigate the situation. It is also worth noting that 14 days prior to this incident, Junko had called her mother and told her to cancel the missing persons report that was filed for her. The two officers left without pushing the issue further. For the next 28 days, Junko endured the worst torture you can imagine. During the first 10 or so days that she was taken prisoner in Minato's residence, she was forced to perform sexual acts that were already mentioned and also forced to pleasure herself in front of the boys in that room for their entertainment. She was forced to drink her own urine and consume live cockroaches. After a while, she was beaten so severely that she couldn't swallow food or water without immediately regurgitating it. After the first 10 days, the boys that had kidnapped her had essentially lost all sexual interest in her and she eventually just became a toy that they would torture for their own entertainment or for taking out their anger. It's also worth mentioning at this point in time that she was malnourished, being regularly denied food and water, and whenever the boys didn't want to see her, she was forced to stay inside of the freezer, while at nighttime she was forced to sleep on the balcony during freezing cold winter time in Tokyo, Japan. For perspective, Tokyo is about the same level north as the American Midwest or Western Europe. So as you can imagine, the winters were quite chilly. The beatings became so severe that she couldn't breathe through her nose, perhaps due to both inflammation as a result of the beatings as well as blood clots forming in her nasal cavity. Heavy objects such as dumbbells were used to beat her so severely that the bones in her arms, hands, and fingers eventually were broken and some, if not all of her fingernails were broken off or shattered. She could no longer walk due to the beatings she had endured and her legs were lit on fire for nothing more than the entertainment of the boys. A small glimmer of hope had come around three weeks of enduring this treatment when she crawled down the hallway and reached a phone and dialed the number for emergency services while the thugs were sleeping. She was just about to say something when Miano forced the phone from her hand and hung up. 
Emergency services sent a phone call back to the residence that made this call, where Miano picked up and stated that he had dialed by mistake. Her captors didn't let this go lightly. Once again, she was lit on fire and the boys found sick entertainment in taking turns jumping on her head while she was laying on the floor, which is a form of pain that many of us cannot even begin to fathom. The sexual torture that she was enduring at this point involved sticking lit light bulbs into her vagina. She had one of her nipples ripped off with a pair of pliers and had sewing needles stuck inside of her breasts. The boys repeatedly stuffed bottles of common small beverages into all entrances to her body, both broken and unbroken. Cigarettes were put out on her body numerous times, including in both of the openings on the bottom half of her body and her face. Perhaps worse yet, she had firecrackers stuck in every opening on her body and then lit, including her nose and her ears, which caused her to become almost completely deaf. Shortly after New Year's Day of 1989, Junko had become almost completely unrecognizable, had several broken bones, several concussions, and her digestive system could not function properly, meaning that if she could keep anything down that she consumed, it came out as blood. The boys wanted to play a board game with her, and somehow she had won the board game. In retaliation, the boys put lighter fluid in every opening of her body, including her eyes, lit a match, then tossed it onto her body. She tried somehow to put out the fire, but had no strength to do so. Broken bones in every part of her body would make rolling extremely painful. Lighting her on fire in the way that she was lit on fire this time around perhaps allowed the fire to access and damage very, very sensitive internal organs on her body such as her lungs and her heart while simultaneously burning her eyes shut. This resulted in her body going into shock and convulsing for about two hours. On January 4th, Junko had finally passed away. Unsure of what to do, the boys knew that they had to hide the body, and after shortly panicking, they decided to fit her body into a tight oil drum and then fill it with concrete. After the concrete had dried, they rolled it into an open plot of land, assumingly at nighttime, next to a commonly used road in Koto, a district of Tokyo that is located on the coast about an hour's drive away from the Saitama Prefecture's city center. For a couple of weeks, no one suspected anything of Junko, who was now missing for one month and 22 days. The boys may also have had a good chance to get away with this murder. If they had sworn to themselves right then and there that they would change their ways and never do anything like this again, it is possible that they wouldn't have been caught. One day, Miyano and Joe were arrested involving severe sexual violations against a woman that they had committed in December of 1988. It's important to remember that throughout the entire duration of the more severe torture that she endured, Junko was in the Minato's home meaning that Miyano, Joe, and Watanabe were all free to roam or at least take turns watching Junko to ensure that she wouldn't try to escape while she was still alive in Minato's residence. On March 29th, 2023, Miyano and Joe were being interrogated regarding an incident with a disturbing violation with a completely different woman while Junko was held captive at Minato's residence. They were also being questioned with regards to the disappearance of a young woman and her child together that, to this day, remains unsolved. For those of you who are not familiar, if someone is arrested and accused of a crime in Japan, the police can hold the suspect for questioning for up to 23 days. Under these circumstances, it is not unusual for suspects to crack under pressure. Additionally, Google searching reveals that in some circumstances that this can be brutal to suspects, even in cases without sufficient evidence to link a suspect to a crime. In more severe cases, some suspects are even held without access to a lawyer, what some of us would call a human rights violation. Luckily, in these circumstances, it paid off. During interrogations, Miano was asked a broad question by a detective about a girl who had gone missing. Miano, who was under the impression that Joe had already confessed to her torture and murder, confessed to just enough information on the kidnapping, torture, and sexual acts that the boys had performed on Junko Furuta. Upon hearing this, interrogators reacted as if they were not expecting this statement and then demanded a full confession from Miano. It may have been something like Miano saying, yes, we made Junko disappear, we were responsible for that, and then the cops latched onto that story and forced a full confession from Miano. Miano stated the location of Junko's body in the oil drum, police found it, and conducted an autopsy. Bottles of common, small vitamin drinks were found inside of her digestive tract, her face was unrecognizable, autopsies had indicated that the size of her brain had shrunk, and although she had sustained unthinkable damage to her entire body, including her uterus, she was pregnant when she had died. 
As the story became increasingly corroborated, the arrests of Minato Nobuharu and Watanabe Yasushi were made. All four of the teenagers were given separate trials. Before we go any further, it's also important to mention the age of majority in Japan at the time, or in other words, the age that you were recognized as an adult legally in Japan was 20 years of age when Junko had died. So, since all four of the suspects were under the age of 20, they were all tried as minors. Additionally, due to the fact that they were minors at the time, they were entitled to trial without their names being published. However, a popular Japanese magazine at the time leaked the names of all four boys, stating that since they committed absolutely inhuman crimes, they did not deserve any level of humanity or even humane treatment. Other dark caveats or technicalities resulted in not a single one of the four suspects being tried for murder or manslaughter directly, but instead injury that led to death. It goes without saying, they were going to be sentenced for something far less severe than murder. Of the dozens of known men to have sexually violated Junko Furuta while she was being held captive in the home of Minato, only two more were arrested and tried. DNA evidence was used to arrest and identify two more culprits who were charged with R.A.P.E. Tetsuo Nakamura and Koichi Ihara. Koichi Ihara is the one we mentioned earlier who confessed to his brother that he was bullied into violating Junko's body while she was still alive. There is no information available on the sentences that they received in English. Please let us know in the comments if you have found any information on this. Additionally, due to the use of DNA evidence, it is also very possible that of the dozens or so men who violated Junko, several more arrests may have been made, but their trial results have not been made public. Before we get into sentencing of the four main suspects, some important information needs to be shared that hasn't been already. When Junko's mother found out the horrific extent of the crime that took place with her daughter, she fainted and had to endure a long visit to a psychiatric hospital followed by months of intense psychotherapy. Minato's brother was arrested but then released after police found no reason to charge him with a crime. Minato's parents never reported the crime to police because they were afraid of the Yakuza harming them, their son harming them, and also their reputation in public being absolutely tarnished. Junko's family later filed a civil suit against Minato's family, winning a cash settlement of 50 million yen, or at the time, approximately 370,000 US dollars. To cover this lawsuit, Minato's family had to sell the home where Junko was tortured. Both of the police officers who visited Minato's residence to see if there was a girl being held captive were fired due to public backlash. Remember, they were invited inside the home and refused. If they had gone inside the home, they could have rescued Junko. And then none of this would have ever happened. Joe's surname has been a bit of a mystery. Some sources state that his surname is Ogura, while others state his surname is Kamisaku. A crime sleuthing website says that it is believed that his desire for privacy upon his release from prison led to him persuading a supporter of his to adopt him and help change his surname. In court, all four of the main suspects, Miyano Hiroshi, Minato Nobuharu, Joe Ogaru aka Joe Kamisaku, and Yasushi Watanabe all pled guilty. Miyano initially received 17 years for his role in the plot, but was resentenced to 20 years after an appeal failed. Watanabe was originally sentenced to 3 to 4 years, then tried to appeal his case, and his sentence was upgraded to 5 to 7 years. Joe Ogura, aka Kamisaku, was sentenced to 8 years in a juvenile detention center for his role in the crime. Minato was initially sentenced to 4 to 6 years, and then resentenced to 5 to 9 years after another appeal. After serving their sentences, two of the four convicted went on to become repeat offenders, and three of them were arrested at least once more. After his release, Minato moved in with his mother but was arrested in 2018 for the attempted murder of another man that he was beating and pulled out of the man's car. The man was losing the fight and attempted to re-enter his car when Minato slashed his neck with a knife. The man survived the attack and Minato went to court for this crime but there is no more information available for this case. If Minato was ever sentenced to another prison term for this event, this information simply is not available in 2023 or at least any Google searches conducted in English. Ogura, aka Kamisaku, was known to have boasted regularly about taking the life of Junko. 
After his release, he was picked up by Japanese police for detaining and beating another man whom he had believed was having an affair with his girlfriend in 2004. He didn't simply beat the man that he had suspected of cheating with his girlfriend, he beat the man forced him into his own car, and then drove him into a bar that his mother owned where he tied up this man and beat him for four more hours, boasting that he had killed someone before and knew how to get away with it. For this, he was sentenced to four years in prison. The ringleader of the original suspects, Miano, was said to have rejoined the Yakuza immediately upon his release. There are reports of his arrest for fraud, but it's unclear if he served any prison time for this. Please remember this photo as it is extremely important. I'll explain why at the end of this video. With regards to Yasushi Watanabe, he is essentially the only one who wasn't arrested since serving his time in prison the first time around and may possibly be the only one who went on to live a normal life after he got out of prison. Upon the return of Junko's body to her family, the funeral procession started from the Furuta residence and slowly made its way to the cemetery. Her family members placed white flowers on her coffin and lit incense sticks, a symbol of their love and respect for Junko. A few of Junko's close friends also attended the funeral, their faces stained with tears. They placed small origami cranes on the coffin, a symbol of hope and healing. A company that wanted to hire Junko to work for them full-time after she graduated from high school gave her family the uniform that would have become Junko's. It was also placed on the coffin. As the ceremony came to an end, the friends of Junko hugged each other, finding solace in each other's company. One such friend had written a handwritten letter and read it aloud stating that finally Junko had come home and she could rest in peace. The principal of her high school handed Junko's family a graduation diploma that she would have received had she not disappeared. Junko's death had shocked the entire nation and the world. Her funeral was a reminder of the brutality and cruelty that exists in society. As the mourners dispersed, they carried with them the memory of Junko, a young girl who had her entire life ahead of her, but whose life was cut short by the hands of evil. With that, we conclude the entirely uncomparable tragedy of Junko Furuta. This is one of those cases that continues to enrage people everywhere, both in Japan and globally. But do you all remember that photo I showed you all earlier that I told you to remember? This is a mugshot for a completely unrelated criminal, and already three different people have used it online thinking that this is a picture of Miyano 30 years after he committed his crime against Junko. Initially, I thought this was a real photo of Miyano 30 years after the crime. So then I reverse traced the image using an AI powered facial recognition technology website and found out who it really was. We all got taken for a bit of a ride, however it's also given me my next case to present to you all. For the sake of remembering Junko Furuta, as well as reminding people that police need to do their jobs correctly, please like this video. If you all think you'll be back to this channel, consider subscribing. I have a lot of things going on right now in my personal life, mostly good things, and I don't know how much more regularly I'll be able to continue uploading, but if nothing else, I can probably do one video each week. Please remember that every day is a new opportunity to see the light, and until next time, I bid you all farewell.